Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for this meeting, looking at maintaining momentum in Sudan's transition, delivering international support. Uh, my name is Ahmed Soliman, and I'm a research fellow with the Africa Programme at Chatham House, uh, specialising in the Horn of Africa. Um, I'd like to welcome our audience today. Uh, those participating through Zoom and those also joining us via Facebook Live. Uh, and I'd especially like to welcome our speakers uh, for this event, Dr. Suleiman Baldo, who's a senior policy advisor with the Enough Project, uh, Lauren Blanchard, who's a specialist in African affairs with the Congressional Research Service in the US, and Dr. Annette Weber, Senior Fellow of the Africa Middle East Division with SWP, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Um, as you all know, Sudan's transition is really at a pivotal moment uh, with progress towards building the foundations for lasting peace, economic stabilization, uh, better livelihoods, and strengthened institutions fraught with many obstacles. Um, with a hybrid civilian military relationship very finely balanced, urgent international assistance is required to sustain the momentum of the civilian administration across priorities like economic reform, providing social welfare, arrears clearance and debt relief, delisting from the US state sponsor of terrorism status, and the implementation of any future signed peace agreements. Uh, the upcoming partnership conference at the end of June offers a crucial opportunity for Sudan's partners to commit funds and coordinate their efforts in support of Sudan's reform priorities. Uh, our speakers today are going to assess some of these issues, the progress made so far in the transition, any potential roadblocks now and, and further ahead, um, and explore whether in these uncertain times uh, an enhanced international response that helps Sudan to consolidate consolidate progress in key areas is likely to be forthcoming. Um, before we get started, I have some housekeeping points for you all. Um, all of our attendees are going to be muted during the presentation, um, but you will be able to use the raise hand function uh, at the bottom of your screens in order to ask a question live, and we'd very much encourage you to do so. Um, if selected, you'll be granted by my colleagues the ability to unmute and ask your question. Uh, apologies in advance if you're not able to ask a question at the event today. We have 200 people currently participating in the event. Uh, our Zoom participants can also submit written questions uh, in the Q&A box throughout the meeting. But uh, I'd like to highlight again and stress that we would, we would very much prefer people to ask their questions live via the raise hand function during the question and answer period after our presentation so that you can ask these questions directly. Um, unfortunately, we're unable to take questions from participants joining us through Facebook Live at this time, so please accept our apologies for this. Um, our, um, this meeting is on the record, which means that you can use the information from this meeting and identify any speaker or participant uh, who is uh, interjecting in the meeting. Uh, also, just a reminder that filming and recording of this event is not allowed without prior permission from Chatham House. Um, however, members of the audience are very welcome to tweet the event using the hashtag, hashtag CHAfrica. Um, and as I said, this, this event is on Facebook Live at the moment. Um, I'll, with no further ado, introduce our, our esteemed speakers and then hand over to them for 10 minute presentations uh, and then we can uh, progress towards a, a discussion and Q&A. So uh, firstly, we have Dr. Suleiman Baldo, who is Senior Policy Advisor for the Enough Project, uh, where he works on humanitarian concerns, economic development, conflict resolution, justice and human rights on the continent. Uh, he was previously Director of Sudan Democracy First Group, a Sudan focused think tank aiming to help bring about democratization and peace in the country. Uh, in 2013, he worked as an independent expert to the UN on human rights issues in Mali and as an advisor to the UN and AU mediation teams in Darfur. Prior to this, Dr. Baldo served as director, director of the Africa Program at the International Center for Transitional Justice, 
and also as uh, the Africa Director at International Crisis Group. He has also worked for Human Rights Watch and Oxfam America. Uh, our second speaker, Lauren Blanchard, is a specialist in African affairs with the Congressional Research Service, where she provides nonpartisan analysis on African political, military, and diplomatic affairs and on US policy towards the region to members of the United States Congress. Ms. Blanchard's portfolio focuses on East Africa, Chad, and Nigeria, and on security issues and military engagement on the continent. She's written extensively on these topics and testified before Congress on terrorist threats in the region, US security assistance, and the US military Africa command. Uh, previously, Ms. Blanchard managed governance programs in East and Southern Africa and served as a legislative, legislative assistant in the US Senate. Um, our final speaker is Dr. Annette Weber, who is a senior fellow in the Middle East and Africa Research Division for the German Institute for International and Security Affairs based in Berlin. Her regional expertise is the Horn of Africa and Red Sea, and she has advised the German Chancellery, Presidency, Ministries, and the German Parliament. Dr. Weber is, has also advised several mediation projects in the Horn of Africa, previously for the Berghoff Foundation and currently for the CHD, the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Previously, she worked as a coordinator for the Ecumenical Network on Central Africa, was a researcher on Sudan and Somalia with Amnesty International in London, and worked as a consultant for Human Rights Watch. So as you will see, all of our speakers bring a wealth of expertise on Sudan and the region uh, to our event today. Um, it leaves me with great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Suleiman Baldo, who will be talking to us about some of the progress and challenges of the transitional government and, and the need for international support. So over to you, Suleiman, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, I would want to start with a statement, a matter of fact statement by the Minister of Finance, uh, Ibrahim al Badawi, in an interview to Al Tayyar newspaper. That was on May 14th. He said that he, the Minister of Finance has no visibility over the income of the Civil Aviation Authority, which is run by the Ministry of Defense, uh, accounts collected for overflight rights, and, uh, ground services go directly to a bank account in Switzerland, and from there it's managed from a bank account in United Arab Emirates by the military. Nor could the Minister of Finance count uh, on the recent uh, foreign currency flows due to the opening of the Saudi market to exports of um, processed meat, packaged meat, frozen to Saudi Arabia, a new market for one of the military companies uh, specialized in meat exports to the Egyptian army, its main client in the region. And therein lies the largest challenge uh, in my uh, view facing the reform efforts of this quote-unquote civilian-led cabinet. The historic compromise on which this transition has been based uh, granted the, you know, within the Constitution and Declaration broad executive and legislati legislative powers to the civilian component. However, it left intact the military and economic power of the military component. Uh, which the regime, uh, you know, built over three decades uh, of, of Bashir's rule uh, into the security and defense establishment. Bashir rule was a perfect kleptocracy. It hijacked the country's wealth for the benefit, first and initially, of the Islamist movement, and then the ruling National Congress Party and the inner circle of the Islamist movement the ruling party and the prominent personalities within the regime, is starting with the family of Amr al-Bashir himself, other insiders, commercial partners uh, of the same, and so on. Uh, and to be able to protect that system of grand corruption, constructed deliberately to be one of grand corruption, a lot of economic power was granted to the economic and to the military and security sector to protect and ensure the survival of this kleptocratic construct. So um, now 
this is a situation where in, in the transition, the, the civilian component, therefore, uh, had the uh, authority, executive and legislative. Legislative is still frozen because the transitional legislature has yet to be formed. But then all the power and all the money is on the other side, protected by the guns of the military and the security uh, you know, component. Uh, despite this uh, complex situation, now playing again is a backdrop of COVID-19 emergency. Sudan is one of the worst uh, affected countries in the region. There have been remarkable reforms uh, that the civilian-led uh, side of, of the transition was able to achieve. Um, the military and security actors conceded large spaces for civilians to introduce human rights, uh, improvements and legal reforms. And I want to cite here examples that are very well known to you without further you know, detail, uh, particularly the, the repeal uh, of the public order uh, law that for three decades has in one form or another uh, iteration uh, has been a daily affront to the dignity of women in Sudan. And this explains their massive uh, you know, participation in the uprising that brought about uh, the change. Uh, and therefore, such reforms are uh, underway. We, we have seen uh, you know, the work of the anti-corruption committee set to dismantle uh, the regime, recover assets, and introduce forms of anti-corruption. Uh, this is the anti-corruption body of today, uh, translating into seizures of assets from uh, key NCP uh, actors who benefited from grand corruption. Uh, the work of this committee leaves a lot to be desired, however, in terms uh, of uh, accountability uh, for the massive theft of the resources uh, of the country. Theft of Sudan wealth means that theft of the life and aspirations uh, of the new generations in Sudan in having, uh, you know, uh, dignified life in their own country, and this accounts for the massive participation of youth at grassroots level in the uprising. They are the driving power uh, behind the transition, although they are not on the map, and the configuration of the main actors, military, civilian, and so on. Don't count them out. They are still out there. They are the guardians of this achievement, and they would not allow it to be hijacked by power grab by anyone uh, on any side. Uh, the, there was an exceptional uh, pamper harvest for wheat, for example, uh, ra, you know, thanks uh, in many ways to the Ministry of Agriculture, Agriculture and Ministry of uh, Irrigation and the massive mobilization of farmer uh, associations in, in production areas as well as private uh, investors. Energy and mining, there is a lot happening there with little information spotlight, uh, mainly uh, you know, in, in cleaning up the mining sector uh, from the control and, and hegemony of the former National Intelligence and Security Services. Uh, but uh, you know, a lot remains to be done to ensure a complete uh, takeover of the state with the resources that are flowing. Uh, from the mining sector, and particularly that of gold, and we'll come to that later. The Minister of Finance has introduced subs, you know, subsidy reforms. Uh, in plain language, you know, there is now uh, you know, uh, a de facto uh, lifting of the subsidy on benzene, you know, on, on fuel, uh, diesel, and, and gas, which allowed the ministry, of course, to increase the wages. Uh, of uh, public sector workers. In the cases of the lowest uh, pays workers, the increase has been uh, by as much as 600 uh, percent. Uh, but then the wages that were practiced uh, over the three decades were really not living wages, and the move has really satisfied uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of the uh, you know grassroots you know teachers and, and, and workers uh, throughout Sudan. Uh, the subsidy reform also allowed the ministry to increase financing to the Ministry of Health to enable it to uh, face the COVID-19 spread. Uh, and yesterday, and this is my last point here, the High Committee for Economic Emergencies has liberalized completely the trade uh, in gold and the export in gold with the, uh, you know, a new directive from the Central Bank of Sudan meant 
to encourage official exports uh, of gold and to end the constant hemorrhage of Sudan gold uh, that was massively uh, you know, smuggled uh, mainly to the United Arab Emirates and gold market uh, in, the, in Dubai. Uh, the threats remain uh, to this uh, you know, uh, transition. Uh, this functional civil service uh, meant that all decisions were very slow to be uh, processed and, and take effect. Uh, the relationship between government and among government ministries, you know, some lack of coordination uh, and internal uh, divisions and disputes between the cabinet and its uh, supposedly political cons constituency of the forces of freedom and change itself, you know, facing a lot of internal tensions, division and factionalism. Um, now, the largest threat for me is the proliferation uh, of weapons in the hands of civilians. Uh, Bashir regime was built on a, a militia state. You know, he created hundreds of tribal militias and generously the Sudan Armed Forces and National Intelligence and Security Services uh, provided weapons, small and less small, uh, to many tribal groups that are now holding on to these weapons. In most of the recent intercommunal uh, confrontations, uh, incidents have spiraled out of control from individual, uh, you know, individual incidents of uh, either livestock uh, theft or even family feuds. Uh, and uh, if the parties are on different, uh, you know, ethnic, uh, from different ethnic groups, you immediately have hundreds of people equipped with technicals and clashing course and RPGs and, you know, all kinds of uh, these, uh, you know, uh, weapons fighting each other with hundreds of people killed and displaced. Because of ethnic recruitment, we had in a recent uh, incident in Kadugli, one unit of the armed Sudan armed forces fighting a unit of the rapid support forces. This doesn't mean that Sudan army is fighting the rapid support forces. It means the local component of each of these regular forces has been so ethnically you know, maintained that uh, an, an individual incident has you know, translated into running gun bottles, bottles right in midtown of Kadugli, the capital of South Kordofan, uh, you know, federal state, between a government unit and an RSF unit. Therefore, the situation is very dire. Uh, it means that the ongoing peace process would really have to address this disarmament beyond that of uh, DDR of the disarmament and you know, demobilization and reintegration of uh, rebel fighters, but rather the collection of weapons in a consensual and, and voluntary way from the hands of civilians. This is a matter much more important to be left to the military alone, uh, just as war is. And therefore the civilian component has to take ownership of this and proceed to the you know, uh, comprehensive national campaign for disarmament uh, at essential. I know and I'm aware of the time. Uh, my recommendations to the international community uh, is that there is, you know, there is a lot of expectation and demands and, and frustration uh, from the civilian government. But from what I know by following developments is that the civilian government is in many ways acting as firefighters having to deal with daily immediate crisis of making sure the next shipment of diesel is there in time uh, of, of, uh, uh, for this uh, you know, uh, harvest or preparation of the summer season, uh, making sure that the next shipment uh, of uh, agricultural fertilizers uh, is coming in on time so that the season is not lost because of shortages in packaging, for example, by, you know, a lack of, uh, you know, jute, uh, which is imported uh, from Bangladesh and, and so on. Sudan is one of the largest consumers of this uh, particular commodity and so on. And in this case, <coughs> there is a growing frustration. Sorry about that. There's a growing frustration that, <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, can you hear me? There's a growing frustration that, uh, you know, the, the, the government is thrown into water and asked not to drown, you know, with its hands uh, tied behind its back. Therefore, there is a, you know, a commitment, you know, to, to, to ensure that 
the civilian government is in a stronger position to take on the challenge of the hegemony of the military on the national economy. And until that happens, there will be no you know, stability in this transition and it may be lost. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norman. Thank you for that rich overview of, of you know, what, what is being grappled with in Sudan at the moment and, and some of those really specific insights I thought were extremely interesting as well. Um, I'll quickly move to, to Lauren uh, Blanchard, who's going to talk to us broadly about US-Sudan relations at the moment, uh, you know, including the SST delisting process, uh, some of the issues around debt relief and, and wider US support as well. Uh, thank you for joining us, Lauren. Have we lost Lauren? I think we may have lost Lauren from our connection. Um, in that instance, I suggest that we, uh, we turn swiftly to, to Annette. And if, Annette, if you wouldn't mind joining us and going next, and then we'll see if we can sort the connectivity issues out with Lauren um, and you know, telling us more about the upcoming Sudan Partnership Conference and, uh, and, and the European efforts to support Sudan. Yes, absolutely. Um, I just see that Lauren is trying to connect back in. Do we want to give her a second yeah. or should I just go ahead? Um, let I, I think perhaps proceed and, okay. and then and we can resolve okay. Lauren's issues and maybe Lauren will be able to join us for the, for the next. Okay. Well, first, thank you, uh, Ahmed and, and uh, Chatham House for inviting me. And, and second, thank you, um, Suleiman, for giving this really in-depth overview and pointing out what I would say are the, the core issues. Um, you, were, you were talking about you know, the kleptocracy and the political situation that, that the transitional government has found itself, but also the efforts that are already underway in terms of trying to follow the money, but also not just follow the money, but also make use of that money to bring it back and how that can, can be done. I think this is one of the preconditions, I would think, is not just a precondition for a successful um, conference, but a successful transition. And I think what we have, what my understanding is from what what is coming is that it's necessary for those who are participating and those who are inviting and leading that we are, you know, and this is something that everybody says, but I think it, it cannot be mentioned um, enough, that we're at a, at a historical crossroad and that the transition in Sudan really is such a special, um, great achievement by the by the people of Sudan um, and to support this is much more than just responding to to an economic crisis by supporting this of course we also um, hoping and I think everybody wants to support a transition that is that is much more bringing the voices of those on the streets but also in the peripheries in I think that is something um, I would see as a precondition from the Sudanese side that it's yes it should be a Sudanese led uh, process. So even if there's a one, uh, one day conference, but the process itself has to be led by the Sudanese, but it has to be led by a more inclusive understanding of the Sudanese. That's one point on the Sudanese side. The second point, and again, thank you, Suleiman, for, for pointing out um, the political economy aspect of it. The second point is what economy are we talking about? We, we do see parallel economies, the old kleptocratic economy that is not disrupted. I mean, we see the efforts by the Sudanese um, government, we see the efforts by the committees, but that is still an economy going on. And partially those in the transitional government um, are part of that economy. Those in the military, those in the RSF, those in the GIS have been part of that parallel economy. So I think when we talk about DDR, when we talk about SSR, when we talk about political changes um, and, and support for the economy, that has to be uh, taken on board. It's not either the economy or the political transition. And it's also um, actors in both fields have, you know, are, are playing roles in all three fields, in the new economy, in the old economy, um, and in the political field. I think this is, of course, a challenge, but of course, it's also, um, it, it needs clarity, but it also needs an understanding for those calling for the conference, for those participating in the conference, um, and for those we hope, or, or the, those organizers hope to, to get, um, you know, to get pledges and to get um, impact from, 
to understand that it's not just an economic conference. It has to be thought in a, in a political way. And I think this is the second precondition for me to, to have a successful conference is for the international financial, inst financial institutions um, to think politically, that it's not just, you know, COVID response, it's not just um, humanitarian response, it's not a short term um, support, but it has to be a long-term substantial support. And lastly on that, um, I think for, for the success for this conference, and I'm glad to see some of the some of these aspects happening right now is a more courageous um, role of the Europeans, you know, the, the Germans, the Europeans and the UN uh, together with the, with the Sudanese are, are, um, are hosting this conference or the, the Germans are hosting it, but the others are co-organizing it. And I think it, it's, it's important that the lead is taken and not waited for, you know, for the US to, to come around, but that the lead is taken and pushed in a collective manner. And I think these are the issues um, that, that are the preconditions. And I think the Sudanese are doing an excellent job right now. But as, as Suleiman said, you know, the, the parallel economies are, of course, a huge obstacle. I think politically, what we see in comparison in the region, um, you know, when we look around, we, we see Libya, we see Ethiopia, we see other regions. I think what we still see in Sudan is there is fragmentation. Yes, there is fragmentation in the political arena, but there is still trust um, and thereby legitimacy for the transitional government. And I think that is an asset um, that needs to be strengthened. Um, and I, again, I, I, I think I'm of the opinion we shouldn't wait until February uh, when the, when the um, civilian side is taken over the, the, the sovereign council. Um, I think we should strengthen this transition even so currently um, the military is, is heading the, the the council. So these are the three pre preconditions for me. The, the steps that I think um, are in line or lined up right now and where I think, um, you know, huge efforts and, and good, good positions have been achieved is basically tackling the big money. Because we all agree, you know, bilateral funding is important, but getting access to, uh, to financial flows from the World Bank and the IMF, of course, is much bigger and much more substantial. Um, Lauren will, will explain to us why this is difficult and why the SST, of course, um, you know, is, is bringing difficulties to, to access to um, HIPIC, to, to debt relief, to, to all of the, you know, uh, regions or areas that, that the World Bank could normally help. However, what I think is already a very positive signal is the the negotiations we see right now with the with the um, IMF on the SMP, but even more, the question of the pre areas um, areas clearances that are happening with the World Bank. I remember talking to representatives of the World Bank only in February at the Munich Security Conference in Munich, um, when the representatives of the World Bank were talking about how difficult it is to, to come to a completion point on, you know, how much work it was for, for them to come to a completion point on Somalia and how much more work it will be and how much more difficult it will be to even conceive um, that this could be done for Sudan and to see that four months down the road that first steps have been taken. I think this is already um, very positive, you know, um, signals for, for the conference, but not just for the conference, for, for the whole process. And I think this is where, you know, the Sudanese have done excellent preparations um, and the lobbying and the, and the you know, bringing the, the big players in the World Bank and the IMF um, is, is going well. I think where we also, you know, when we go into HIPIC, when we go into debt relief, of course, the Paris Club members or the Paris Club creditors um, will have to play a role. I said it before, I think it's, it has to be big. I think it has to be, you know, it is a historic chance. It has to be big. But I also think we need to look into the non-Paris Club members, uh, specifically the Gulf states and, and China. China, you know, invested more than eight billions in the infrastructure, in the oil infrastructure in Sudan. Um, I think China needs to come on board if on the 25th or in, in the process needs to come on board because the understanding that goes for the Gulf and everybody else is the understanding is that only um, a stabilized transition um, 
you know, can provide the stability and can provide the basis for their investments, the Gulf investments, Chinese investments, everybody else's investments, um, to to put out fruits. Um, because if you know, if if there is a coup, if there is a fragmentation, if if a conflict will come, if we see uh, a similar scenario than like in in Libya nobody is going to be helped and i think this is something where the diplomacy hopefully can work where i'm not so optimistic to bring uh, the non paris club members in into that responsibility you know when when we talk about the gulf countries um suleiman was mentioning it there were pledges in the beginning you know of three billions there were pledges of a billion and a half we know that 500 million were paid out so money is already pledged money has already been earmarked before COVID, before the recession um, to maybe convince them to also play a role in stabilizing not individual members of the government and specifically members of the government who are closer connected to the parallel economy to the former economy but to stabilize the transitional government and the transitional government's um, economy i think that has to come with a political approach it has to come with a political approach and a political understanding that um you know the common understanding that it's stability that that is beneficial for everybody um and the picking and choosing of individuals might not bring that stability on so um maybe these are my first you know points to in, in terms of the preparation for 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 the 25th um of course, there are huge challenges, um, and you know we've we've talked about the challenges before. We can dip deeper in the challenges, but I'm more optimistic than pessimistic. I think there are chances, um, you know, to 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 have this to be a successful start, but it has to be a connection of a political and economic um, framework and thinking and partnership that is not over after the 25th but starts um basically to engage on the 25th thank you thank you very much and and thank you for kind of emphasizing that the need for long-term engagement and support um which i'll turn to to lauren blanchard now um i think lauren's had some technical difficulties but hopefully we, we have resolved those and, and lauren you're going to talk to us about us sudan relations uh, about SSTD listing process some of the some of the uh, specifics around the debt relief and arrears clearance and, and, and perhaps some wider US support thank you very much for joining us thank you Ahmed, and thank you all for bearing with me on my uh, my technical challenges I hope everyone can hear me okay I've moved from my computer to my iPad to now my phone so hopefully this will hold um, good morning everyone uh, and thanks for uh, thanks for having me here today um, I'm gonna take uh, I'm gonna start by taking a little trip down memory lane with the US Sudan relationship because I think the background and and the layers of um, sort of restrictions on that relationship are important to understand and remember. Um, you know, the, the Bashir regime didn't get off on a good foot, obviously, with a, with a coup, um, uh, and relations really sort of deteriorated throughout the 1990s, um, some key dates being 1993, when the United States designated Sudan as a state sponsor of terrorism, uh, and, and I'll go back to that and, and all of that that entails. Um, the relationship worsening uh, in the mid to late 90s, uh, the United States closed the embassy and pulled the ambassador out in 96. Uh, the embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998 um, were, were a real low point, uh, Sudan being implicated in uh, facilitating those involved in the bombings. And obviously, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, in retaliation, uh, the Clinton administration bombed uh, Al-Shifa pharmaceutical factory. We won't get into that, but um, again, that was a real low point. Um, 2001 was a turning point in the relationship after uh, the attacks on the Twin Towers in 9-11. Uh, and the Bush administration taking a very strong stand. Uh, you are either with us or you are with the terrorists. Uh, and we will consider you a hostile uh, regime if you if you do not denounce terrorism. You start to, started to see the Bashir regime stepping away from some of the um, terrorist groups that it had um, allowed safe haven in the country. 
Um, the CPA negotiations, I think, also allowed some room for the relationship to evolve. Uh, the embassy reopened in the early 2000s, uh, you know, and I think there was a point at which um, there was hope that the relationship could improve further uh, during, during the period of peace between 2005 and, and South Sudan's independence. But of course, what was going on in parallel was a very negative development in Darfur, uh, the declaration of genocide by, by the Bush administration, um, you know, certainly sort of um, was pulling down on anything that was otherwise positive. Of course, at the same time, you also had improving counterterrorism uh, relations between the two countries. Um, independence, I think the Sudanese government thought was going to be another turning point and an option, an opportunity to have the state sponsor of terrorism designation and a number of other legal restrictions uh, on relations uh, lifted. But of course, at the same time, the war in the two areas in the Nuba Mountains and uh, Southern Blue Nile um, was unfolding, uh, Blue Nile was unfolding, uh, which sort of damaged the ability of uh, the administration to, to improve the relationship further. Um, 2014 is a, is a year I would flag in the relationship. That was the year that uh, the French bank BNP Paribas was hit with a record fine for violating US sanctions on Sudan, uh, Iran, and uh, Cuba. Uh, and that fine, $9 billion, I think really shocked the international financial uh, community. And you started to see banks pulling out of uh, Sudan that had remained engaged in the country uh, out of fear of violating uh, the US legal restrictions on dealing in dollar transactions. And I think that that um, inspired the Bashir regime to engage uh, more seriously with the Obama administration on, on some things that uh, were deemed by the United States to be priorities. And so in 2015 and 2016, the Obama administration was able to set up uh, something they called a bilateral re-engagement framework. Uh, and they set up this series of tests, uh, the, the five track process as we call it here in Washington. Uh, it involved some things that the United States wanted to see and that the Obama administration thought that also Congress uh, wanted to see from Sudan. Uh, a ceasefire in Darfur and the two areas was one of those things. Uh, some improvements on the human rights front, um, counterterrorism cooperation, of course, uh, and a number of other things, including cooperation on efforts to find Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance Army. And that led at the beginning of 2017 and the end of the Obama administration's term uh, to uh, the pres President Obama announcing before leaving office, that he was temporarily easing some of the US sanctions, the economic and the trade sanctions on Sudan. Uh, that process continued in the beginning of the Trump administration and in uh, later 2017, the formal lifting of those economic sanctions. Uh, that allowed uh, banks and U.S. companies to uh, engage in transactions in Sudan. The sanctions on the government uh, as a body and in interaction with it uh, were lifted uh, and sort of began um, the process that was to continue um, further improvements. Of course, in uh, late 2019, or late 2019, excuse me, late 2018, the protests and the crackdown uh, slowed that process. And, um, you know, I think uh, there was great relief here in Washington and obviously in Sudan um, with the, with the um, transfer of power uh, in April and the departure of Omar al-Bashir. And I think that was a watershed moment uh, for the administration. Um, in terms of trying to figure out how to reset the relationship. But of course, uh, mid-2019 uh, didn't, didn't turn out, I think, as, as one would have immediately hoped in terms of a transition to civilian rule. Um, the United States uh, playing a role in trying to facilitate uh, a positive outcome um, with some mixed, um, mixed uh, results. Um, the, the formation of the transitional government in August and September of last year was critically important. And I think you've seen um, a number of signals from this administration uh, about how they want to move forward with the relationship. The United States hosted the first Friends of Sudan meeting in, I think, October of last year and signaled uh, a real interest 
interest in trying to support Sudan's economic recovery. Uh, of course, some things hanging over that, uh, that engagement effort being still the state sponsor of terrorism designation, uh, which the United States signaled that it was going to be working with Sudan on, on lifting. Um, the December visit by Prime Minister Handok to Washington, another very positive step, and I think it set a very um, a positive tone with members of Congress. Uh, Prime, Prime Minister Hamdok had some important meetings with both the Senate Foreign Relations Committee members and the House Foreign Affairs Committee members, and, and those committees are key uh, to um, rolling back some of the remaining legal restrictions on, on relations. Um, I think another positive sign that we saw was the administration indicating uh, that there was agreement with Sudan to exchange ambassadors for the first time in in several decades. Um, and we are looking forward to uh, Ambassador Sati's uh, arrival here in Washington, DC, uh, travel permitting. Um, so let me talk a bit about the state sponsor of terrorism designation and what it does and what it doesn't do. Uh, it does not uh, prohibit trade with Sudan by US companies or other uh, foreign companies. Uh, it does prohibit some types of trade of dual use items, uh, defense items, um, but that's not sort of a, a primary um, negative drag on the economy. Uh, I think one of the things that it does most importantly is with relation to both uh, debt relief and uh, US voting at the international financial institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, the Africa Development Fund. The state sponsor of terrorism designation uh, requires US representatives at those banks to vote against Sudan uh, financing for Sudan. And, and that's important, but it is not the primary reason that the IMF and the World Bank are not able to finance uh, Sudan's uh, economic recovery right now. Uh, the primary blockage uh, to IFI engagement at the moment is Sudan's arrears to the funds. Uh, Sudan owes roughly uh, three billion in arrears to uh, first and foremost the IMF, also the World Bank and the AFDB. Um, that three billion in uh, debt arrears to the IFIs is part of a much larger international uh, debt relief pack, debt relief, or debt, sorry, debt that Sudan owes, totaling uh, somewhere over 60 billion, I think, at this point. Um, I would flag importantly that about three billion of that debt is owed to the United States. And that is important because the United States has to approve uh, and finance uh, the, the getting rid of that debt um, before Sudan can move forward on the international debt relief process, the, the HIPIC debt relief process. Uh, and, and SST prohibits that. So um, moving forward on debt relief, of course, being a process uh, that Sudan has begun uh, with the IMF uh, and the staff monitor program that's being negotiated right now um, could, could be a major turning point on that. But of course, for Sudan to uh, reach the decision point in the HIPAA process, uh, they will also have to be uh, off the, the state sponsor of terrorism list. So where are we now in that process? Uh, I know everybody is, is uh, that's, the, that's the big question. Um, the administration has emphasized, and I will emphasize, it's a process, uh, it's not an event. The administration can't, this is not an executive order that can be signed and President Trump uh, announced tomorrow that Sudan is off the list. They have to go through an intelligence assessment determining that Sudan no longer uh, sponsors or harbors uh, terrorist groups. And uh, that process has to lead to a report to Congress. Congress uh, has 45 days to review it. Uh, and after that point, if Congress does not object in the form of a joint resolution of disapproval, which could be vetoed by the president, uh, then Sudan is removed from the list. Now, there are statutory requirements and there are policy requirements that each administration determines. The statutory requirements are those set by Congress uh, and the policy requirements are set by the administration. Um, the administration has hinted in a number of ways and some members of Congress have signaled approval for this, uh, this idea that the decision be linked to Sudan's settlement of claims uh, of, of victims of terrorism in which Sudan has been implicated. Now, we saw earlier this year, Sudan settle claims of the um, victims of the USS Cole bombing, um, the major outstanding uh, 
incident for which Sudan uh, has uh, unsettled claims is the 1998 embassy bombings. Uh, and this is a, a very substantial sum of money, of course, uh, at the moment, um, but Sudan's lawyers and the lawyers of the victims uh, and the lawyers of the uh, State Department have been negotiating uh, a possible settlement agreement. And I think that that's been, uh, that's been hinted at by, by US officials. Um, that will require some congressional action and so you've got kind of a, a, a network of uh, actions that need to take place, both on the administration side, uh, the government of Sudan side, in terms of paying this agreed upon amount, and then Congress uh, has to pass some legislation. So um, these things uh, moving forward could take a process of, uh, I think at the minimum, uh, probably about two months. Um, but you, you may see some signal if, if, they, uh, if they get to this point and Sudan um, puts forth the money for that settlement, uh, and then uh, the process could move forward, but it's not going to happen by next week in the, the partnership conference. Um, a final point, um, you know, the United States uh, has been providing a substantial amount of humanitarian assistance uh, throughout this entire period. The U.S. is the largest bilateral humanitarian donor uh, to Sudan, uh, usually totaling somewhere uh, between 250 and 350 million dollars a year. I think right now they're at about 275 million dollars for the fiscal year, um, but expecting to get before before the end of the year probably to upwards of 300 or 350 million dollars. A lot of that assistance is uh, in the form of food aid, uh, primarily in Darfur and uh, two areas, um, but also uh, in, in around Khartoum and elsewhere. So um, I'll stop there. And uh, I know that there are probably a lot of questions, so happy to address those then. Thank you so much, Lauren. Really appreciate that. That was a really good insight, especially as well into, I guess, some of the necessary hurdles that, that are still to, still remain in the process and moving forward on, on debt debt relief and SST. Um, we'll move swiftly to questions. As I said at the outset, uh, please do, we encourage you to use the raise hand function in order to ask a question live, so please do that. Um, if you're selected, uh, and you'll be granted the ability to unmute yourself. Uh, so please do uh, introduce yourself, unmute yourself, and, and then introduce yourself. Uh, and again, apologies to those who are able to ask questions live today. Uh, we also have the Q&A function of which a number of you have written questions in as well. But again, we'd encourage you to use the raise hand function and ask your question live. Um, and I'll try and take a couple of rounds, uh, a couple of questions, rounds of questions of, of two or three. So we have a couple of uh, people raising hands at the moment. Uh, so I will ask uh, Salah Kamil Salah if you would uh, like to ask your question, please, and, and please introduce yourself and, and do unmute yourself. Uh, yes, um, I think I'm unmuted now. Can you can can you hear me? Yes. yes uh, welcome, hi, Ahmed. Um, hi, Dr. Suleiman, and uh, the panel. Thank you for a, a very fruitful and uh, uh, interesting uh, talk. My, I have two questions. One for uh, Dr. Baldo. Um, in, in, with, with regards to advocacy um, and the uh, repatriation of looted funds, uh, there are precedents. There are precedents in Nigeria um, and elsewhere, and, and there's a, you know, the, the law is, is there. There's uh, antitrust laws as well. Um, uh, the, uh, Lauren mentioned the, 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 the massive uh, BNP uh, uh, fine. Uh, my question is, why, why, why is there no focus on the repatriation of uh, the funds of the former regime? when it's a uh, common knowledge where these funds um, um, are, are, are to be found. And uh, my question to Lauren is, um, fast forwarding to, to November, um, do you see any difference in uh, US policy towards Sudan uh, in the event of uh, a Biden presidency? And uh, finally, I'll just sneak it in. Um, Secretary well, I think, Pompeo. Salah, okay, we can do two, two, I think is, is probably our limit. And if you would oblige, oblige me, if you could introduce yourself as well, that would be great. Yes. Sorry, um, head, uh, head of uh, Claims and Recoveries at um, the Islamic Development Bank Group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saleh. Thanks for your questions. Um, I will now turn to uh, Dr. Mohammed Hassan Mohammed, I think it is. Please do uh, uh, unmute yourself, Dr. Mohammed, and, and introduce yourself and ask your question. Dr. Mohammed, can you hear me? You. Uh, 
you need to unmute yourself to ask your question. Okay, I'm not getting anything from Dr. Mohammed, so we'll move on to uh, to and apologies if I've mistakenly pronounced this. Uh, Yedrez Senep, uh, please do ask your question. Yedrez, uh, please introduce yourself. Um, hello, um, I'm Jędrzej Czarep from Africa Analyst from the Polish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, so one question uh, which is uh, related to, to the question that we just heard from, from, from our colleague, because we have seen, uh, it is also a question to Dr. Suleiman Baldo, because we have we have seen quite an impressive asset seizures, I mean, domestic asset seizures from, from some of those old regime uh, related financial empires. Uh, could, you, could you please try to assess to which extent did this process help to bridge the financial gap? I mean, the 8 billion that Hamdok famously uh, asked for uh, when, he took, when he took power. And does, this, does it continue to, be, to offer a, a viable source of financial means that could help to maintain the transition momentum for, for some while. And a question to, to Annette Weber, uh, do you see the COVID-19 affecting willingness of the Friends of Sudan to, to contribute to the, to the economic recovery? Uh, would it be enough, I mean, during the conference to, to not only to stabilize its economy, but also to overweight the Gulf states influence and therefore change the balance of power in favor of the Hamdok government? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I'll take one, one more question uh, from Amal Hamdan. Uh, please do unmute yourself, Amal, and introduce yourself. Hi, thank you very much. I'm a London-based electoral systems consultant with the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. Um, my question is, honestly, to anybody from the panel who wants to answer. We saw today that Mohammed Hamdan Dagalu, also known as Hameti, arrived in Ethiopia to discuss border tensions and quote unquote any relevant issues and I'm assuming that's going to be about the grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Um, what does the international community think of Hameti becoming more and more involved in diplomatic efforts that perhaps um, the Prime Minister should be taking the lead in? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Some very clear questions there. Uh, perhaps I'll turn to you first, uh, Suleiman. To, there's a couple of questions pointedly um, directed to you uh, and, and then one to Lauren as well and, and maybe I'll ask uh, whoever wants to to chip in then about the question on, on Hameti's role uh, um, more broadly as a statesman and him developing as a statesman. Um, so please do proceed. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, to the question raised by Mr. Salah from the Islamic uh, Bank Group, about the repatriation of foreign assets of regime insiders. Uh, this uh, process of asset recovery from uh, where they have been part in uh, foreign countries, uh, mainly, uh, you know, in the case of Sudanese uh, kleptocrats uh, around uh, Omar al-Bashir and his regime, uh, the host countries are Malaysia, United Arab Emirates, uh, Turkey, some other tax havens, uh, assets also in, in United Kingdom, USA, uh, and so on. Uh, however, the asset recovery uh, of uh, foreign, uh, you know, possessions uh, acquired with some uh, financial malfeasance in Sudan is a highly legal, complicated legal and, and technical issue. The current uh, committee to dismantle the regime of Bashir, recover assets and anti-corruption, uh, it's a very impossible name <laughs> uh, to translate basically. Uh, that committee doesn't have the investigative capacity to establish that these assets were indeed, uh, you know, acquired through illicit means and that the funds repatriated to purchase these assets in the form of real estate mostly but some luxury items also like private jets or private, uh, you know, luxury cars and so on, that these assets were acquired with uh, illegitimate uh, financial flaws. Uh, and therefore, the, you know, the repatriation of these assets required specialized expert input uh, from quarters that are specialized. The precedent to cite here is that of Kuwait uh, following the invasion of Iraq. They engage, uh, you know, reputable international law firms to recover the assets stolen. 
uh, by Iraq, uh, the, which were indeed in the end repatriated back to Kuwait. So Sudan is in this position where it has to use this kind of expert, uh, you know, uh, knowledge by, uh, you know, by quarters that are specialized in this kind of exercise. Uh, whether these quarters would ask for hefty uh, percentages from the recovered assets uh, or do it uh, on a, you know, a non-profit basis, uh, this is a, you know, a decision point to make uh, by the government of Sudan, and I'm not uh, talking on their behalf. I think they will make the right decision eventually. But uh, be assured that the the question is under consideration, and there will be uh, you know uh, a decision uh, taken in this regard. To the related question of the monetary value uh, of the assets recovered domestically within the uh, country, there was a statement by the spokesperson of the anti-corruption committee, Dr. Salah Manna a few weeks ago that, uh, you know, the estimated value of this assets of $4 billion. That statement was, you know, you know, premature, I would say, uh, in the sense that there hasn't been a proper evaluation of the, uh, you know, the value of the assets, which are mostly, uh, you know, plots of land in the dozens and in some cases hundreds, but, you know, purchased by the Yemen siders in primary, uh, urban uh, plots and residential areas uh, of Khartoum, and some uh, extensive, la you know, large, uh, you know, agricultural or you know, basic uh, agricultural lands uh, in Sudan by regime uh, insiders. Uh, I don't expect this to add to the billions of dollars. Perhaps some, you know, low tens of, of millions. Uh, but then there are also shares, uh, you know, of uh, public. Uh, corporations like the river transport or Sudan Postal Service or Sudan, uh, you know, you name it, uh, maritime lines, all privatized to regime insiders in very shady garage deals. Uh, and the shares have been recovered to the benefit of the Ministry of Finance. There is no way to determine at this time because of the lockdown, the market value. The Ministry of Finance has created a corporation to manage this, uh, you know, domestic assets but uh, don't expect it to be uh, in the billions. I don't think that they have liquidated any uh, to date and that it would not be in the near future that they would be able uh, to that. As to uh, the question for Mrs. Amal uh, Hamdan with regard to Hemeti uh, visit to Ethiopia, the man is becoming a troubleshooter, you know, he's co-chair uh, of the Committee for Economic Emergencies. Uh, so why do we deny him uh, you know, diplomatic roles if he's also playing economic roles in the country. This is a kind of compromises in which the isolation of reform offers in Sudan has forced the civilian government to take so that, you know, basically they try to make, uh, you know, things function uh, given the emergency and the dire uh, daily pressures on the national economy and the national, uh, you know, regional relations uh, of Sudan. And as long as this government remains isolated from international support by other actors in, in, in the regional and international community, it, it would remain vulnerable uh, to this kind of, of, of shared friendships. And I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Suleiman. Um, Lauren, or, do you have any, would you like to come in on any of those questions? Sure. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll start with the question about the, the potential of a Biden presidency. Um, you know, I would underscore, and maybe I didn't make this clear before, US, US policy towards Sudan has been very bipartisan over decades. Um, and uh, while Vice President, former Vice President Biden, uh, you know, he was, he was a former member of Congress, uh, has been engaged on Sudan issues for a long time. He knows the history. Um, I wouldn't expect um, major changes uh, in U.S.-Sudan policy and the trajectory, which, which I think is positive at the moment. Um, under a Biden presidency, I think there would be some differences, uh, um, probably a, a greater focus on, on foreign aid. Uh, U.S. foreign aid has um, seen, seen some pretty significant uh, cuts under the Trump administration, um, larger cuts proposed than uh, were accepted by Congress. Um, but I think you could see a sort of a more robust expansion of the U.S. assistance portfolio uh, to Sudan, particularly in support of the transition 
um, potentially under a Biden presidency. The other um, area I think that you would see uh, quite a bit of difference on potentially would be, of course, immigration policy and uh, Sudan, you know, having been um, formerly on the, uh, the travel ban list and still facing a number of immigration restrictions that, um, that the Biden, uh, a Biden administration might handle differently. Um, but, but this gives me the, the point of uh, emphasizing also that the upcoming elections are, of course, a real distraction uh, here in the United States, as is COVID. Um, but I think you're going to see sort of the, the policy wheels start to turn a bit slower. Um, Congress is going to be uh, going out for extended periods of time uh, to campaign and, and get ready for the elections. Um, the administration, likewise, is going to be focusing sort of increasingly on the elections coming up in November. So so there is, um, I think, a shrinking window to get some things done uh, in terms of the SST um, delisting process and uh, a few pieces of legislation involving Sudan. Uh, there's, a, there's a big bill that was introduced earlier this year, the Sudan Democratic Transition Accountability and Fiscal Transparency Act. It's a mouthful um, by uh, the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, Congressman Engel. Um, if, if that moves forward, um, that would open up a larger amount of uh, U.S. assistance for Sudan. Um, it would uh, set a number of conditions for some further um, steps forward, including um, some conditions for uh, bilateral uh, debt relief, which is, which is um, going, to, going to be uh, a, a big cost for, uh, um, for the United States, and so it's a major decision. Um, so I would say that on the, um, uh, you know, the other thing, uh, either a Biden presidency or a Trump administration uh, that continues next year, there are a number of key points coming up in, in Sudan's political calendar um, that could change the U.S. relationship. Um, you know, a major one being that turnover at month 18 um, of the, the head of the Sovereign Council. Um, and uh, you know, if if that uh, transition were not to happen, of course, I think that would um, that would raise some serious concerns um, in the international community broadly, but in in Washington uh, under either administration about the trajectory of the transition. Um, and uh, you know, I think that there are still concerns here on both sides of the aisle. Um, hear some comparisons to, to Burma and, and worries that um, the military's influence uh, in, in the government uh, continue, you know, not continue at, at, at a high level. Um, and that makes me transition to the GERD talks um, and, and Hemeti uh, being potentially playing a, a more significant role. You know, it's interesting, he is, um, he is, assumed the position of effectively vice president of the country, which, um, you know, in my reading of the transitional constitution doesn't exist. Um, and that is presumably a position that would change um, when the head of the Sovereign Council transitions over to a civilian next year. So, um, you know, what his sort of continued role, particularly as, a, as an emissary of Sudan abroad, um, is after after that transition it remains to be seen. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of issues uh, for, for Sudan with these GERD talks, um, you know, long-term interests, I think, in, in potential improvements in agriculture, um, the ability to control flooding. Um, Sudan has a stake in this beyond sitting as a referee between its two neighbors. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think you'll see some of those technical issues come up, and and really those are um, those are issues best placed for for the cabinet uh, and and the affected ministries to be engaged on. Um, whether Hameti can broker some sort of temporary deal between Egypt and Ethiopia, well, uh, let's see. Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, and then I have a I have a question here in the Q and A box, uh, which is directly for you from uh, Walker Stone. Uh, who's a Sudan scholar at the Center of Sudanese Studies in Yangzhou University in China. And he asks uh, about China's position on the Friends of Sudan, um, why it's not included, or is it possible for it to be included? And, and more importantly, I think, to the crux, what, what role, which I think you, you kind of you pointed to, what role China can play in, in supporting uh, the current transition in Sudan? Right. Um, and I would also like to go 
go back to answering the question um, by our Polish colleague, um, Georgi. So I would like to start there because it, it also comes together in terms of, you know, who is taking responsibilities and maybe it's also um, a question or an answer that is uh, asking Suleiman's position or I would question Suleiman's position saying that, you know, the Sudanese government right now is isolated. I would say that's not the case. And I think what we've seen in the last couple of months is um, basically a lot of effort by a couple of European countries, the US, others, but also by, by European countries um, to to not only on the symbolic level by you know high visit i mean high state level visits i've been i've had the honor to to travel with our foreign minister as well as our president to sudan uh, hamdok was in in berlin to talk with our chancellor um you know i think it's it's not an isolation we haven't you know we've we've had the german parliament defreezing development cooperation that was frozen since 189 with Sudan, defreezing it in a very quick step after after the revolution and, and with the beginning of the transitional government. Yes, with this basically symbolic recognitions, of course, also comes responsibility. And this is where, of course, COVID now comes in and the expectations and, and the expectations in terms of, you know, bilateral donors, bilateral money, how much can be collected by the EU, by the, by the Germans, by the member states. Um, and I think, as I said right in the beginning, I think it needs to be big. It needs to be big to really pay, you know, tribute to the big changes. But I also think it needs to be structural and it needs to be political. So what I mean by this, and that also goes in the direction, you know, can we outdo the Saudis? Um, but also why is Hamidi playing such such an incredibly important role in all things Sudanese right now. It's not just in the economy, it's the regional phase. He is the peacemaker in the country. Um, how come that he can take up all these responsibilities and, and play this role? And I think the countering to this really is strengthening the institutions, strengthening critical infrastructure um, that is not working. And you know that's something that outside money is needed for, that's one thing, but also the political infrastructure. And it was said before, of course, you know, with the, without the parliament, that is that is quite difficult to do. But I think strengthening, you know, the energy sector, and this is where the GERD comes in, that is hugely important to strengthen the energy sector. The Europeans and other friends of Sudan have to take an interest in the regional capacities, in the regional dynamics, and specifically on the Nile discussions right now. And I think these things have to come together. So we shouldn't look at them separately. I, I think if there is a tension and if there is a leadership role being played or a role full of further responsibility, more responsibility that we have seen maybe so far, by European countries, by the EU, and, and by member states, um, I think this has to be taken into, you know, in, into the contextual analysis. So yes, it should be money, definitely, and I'm expecting money to, to come, but I think it's also the attention given to the Nile talks, it's the attention given to the sectoral um, strengthening, you know, the, the critical infrastructure, but also the political infrastructure, because only then um, I think the role of an individual in a country can be balanced. Um, if you don't have a strong infrastructure, if you don't have a strong you know, uh, critical infrastructure, people will, will tend to um, personalize politics. And I think, yes, this is also responsibility for, you know, outside ex uh, external support, including the Friends of Sudan, to support the transitional government in their endeavor to democratize. Um, but I'm not convinced that there, sh that there could be or should be, you know, competition between, let's say, the values of the Europeans and the values of the Gulf states. I think the con convincing has to happen that we have a unified understanding of why a transition, why the success of the transitional government is best for everybody. Um, and I think this is also where, you know, the la last question in my understanding comes in. This is where I would like to hear more from the Chinese perspective. Um, what do they feel is strengthening uh, the situation in Sudan? Where do they see is their, you know, their investment, how can they, um, well, strengthen their, their investment and how can they 
help Sudan to have their investment being paid back. And this is not just, you know, the, the situation in South Sudan that the investment is, is basically not um, amortizing itself. It's, it is also the, the structures and the parallel economy in Sudan itself. So wh what does China think where they can play a role and do they want to play a role in that larger consortium if it's, you know, the, the, the Friends of Sudan, if it's the donor conference, if it's the um, partnership conference, or if it's bilateral. I don't think it has to be in one of these, um, but it has, I think they have to come out with, a, with their part where they see uh, the, the, you know, the support for, for, the, for the transition in Sudan. Thanks. Thank you very much, Aneta. Um, I think we, we should have time for another round of questions. Um, so I, let me take a, a bigger group and then that I think we'll have to be the final round. So we have uh, Samah Salman. Um, please do uh, unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself and ask your question. Samah, do go ahead if you can. We're not hearing you at the moment. Okay, um, I'm not hearing Samah, so I'm going to turn to another uh, person, uh, Rahman Gadir. Please do uh, unmute yourself and um, ask your question and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is um, Abdurrahman Abdel Gadir. I am a farmer. I, I think uh, many of those who are presenting the problem of Sudan, in driving through, they missed the blind spot. Sudan problems, in um, one of the ideas of Dr. Weber, is to Sudanize the problems. You are forgetting that the British Council and Sudan British Overseas Development trained and educated tens of hundreds of thousands, all of them, they left Sudan. If you are coming with your support, with your assistance, with, 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 how are you going to implement, to implement, to, imp to revive the nine projects that were established by the British between Jabal Marra and al Burgay in the northern of Sudan? The foreign element in the Sudanese politics, how do you forget the the assumed legitimate rights of the Egyptians in Sudan. Even now, the Emirates, they're trying to play a part in Sudan. It is a very complicated issue. It is not as simple as that. You must look at the politics of the Sudanese politics in the name of Dr. Weber. So, and I think whatever assistance you're going to get, it won't succeed. Whatever help, it won't succeed. Okay, that Thank is you. a very complicated issue. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. I think maybe we can extrapolate from that a question about, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's broad, but I think, you know, more broadly, uh, you know, Sudan, foreign, foreign engagement and foreign interference, as uh, Abdurrahman put it, in Sudan, and actually how do you revive projects, perhaps the economy, given that uh, you have... Uh, a large brain drain in the country and, and, and there are issues with click issues with capacity as well. Thank you very much for that question. I will uh, ask, turn to Yunus Horna, uh, please if you could introduce yourself and ask your question. Sure, do you hear me? Yes, Yunus, welcome. Yes, hi, hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, this perhaps does uh, pick up on what Abrahman just said and also perhaps a, a point that Aneta made just, just earlier, but you know, there's a diversity of ideas of just what a transition means around the Friends of Sudan table. And I, you know, I think that's, that, that's a problem. People can agree, they're all happy to, to talk about transition, but those concepts are, are, are very different. You know, for, for UAE and KSA and to a different extent, Egypt, um, they're you know, the most highly motivated and most financially able um, of the parties around that table uh, and can therefore exercise the greatest influence to deliver the dispensation that, that they favor. 
Um, and this is particularly so given their cultivated military links, you know, for the UAE with Hemeti, um, for KSA and Cairo with, with, with Burhan. Uh, and of course, there's some uh, uh, counterweight from Doha about this. Um, you know, they should probably show preference for an Islamist return by political means. Um, but uh, but I su so suggest that this sort of UAE K vision and ambition for Sudan is far more military heavy than most, you know, quote unquote, Western states w would like to see. So, you know, um, I was hoping to get some comment on just how to surmount this gap amongst this, this divergence of, of content, con concepts of transition to better harmonize strategic interests on Sudan. Um, you know, yes, we can all agree on stability, but there's still divergent views on, on how to get there. And I, I've literally just come off the, the phone with the, 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 the Emirati Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, mm -hmm. and, and that reinforced this, this sense. Um, so, so I think, yeah, if, if perhaps we can drill down on, on Abrahman's question and, and, and something that Annette had said earlier, that would be most helpful. Thank you very much, Jonas. Um, I will turn to uh, Marwa Kessinger. Uh, please do um, unmute yourself and introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Marwa Kessinger, uh, the chair of Nuba Mountains Women uh, Union. My question to Laura, do you think the cooperation of the transitional government and extra, extra, dry, extra dry, uh, and the handing of the wanted people or criminal will be one of the steps forwards uh, to lifting the economic sanction on Sudan. And what can be more done from the international, uh, for the from the transitional to uplifting the restriction? Marwa, would you be able to um just for our, for our audience, repeat that question. I think you might have missed part of it at the beginning. Yes, I just said, do you think that, for Laura, do you think the cooperation of the transitional government uh, with the ICC to hand the uh, wanted criminal uh, will be one of the steps forward to lifting the, the economic sanction on the Sudan and what can be more done from the transitional to uplifting the restriction? Thank you. Thank you very much, Madwa. Uh, and we'll take one final question. Um, Rosalind Marsden, if you would uh, like to unmute yourself and please ask your question. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Ahmed. It's Rosalind Marsden. I'm an associate fellow at Chatham House. Um, the question I had uh, relates to the, the question of, of the sensitivities that um, are still quite strong about relations between the centre and the peripheries and concern that the voices um, and interests of people from the historically marginalized areas should be taken into account. Um, my impression um, is that, that in the, at the Berlin conference, there may be quite a strong focus on support for the response to COVID and also perhaps support for the social safety net program, the family support program. But clearly um, in the future, there's going to be a really huge need for money to um, support reconstruction and development in the conflict zones. And my question is, um, how do you think um, that the issue of marginalization and the need for large scale economic assistance to support uh, forthcoming peace agreements um, should be addressed uh, both in the short and in the, the medium term? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosalind. Okay, we have a very good set of questions there. Um, perhaps I'll turn uh, first uh, maybe to Annette if you would, wouldn't mind if you uh, come in perhaps on the Gulf. Uh, uh, I guess these dynamics that Yunus mentioned about uh, the count, you know, the, the surmounting the gap between the different uh, tensions and strands that are, are being, that Sudan is being pulled by, by some of its neighbours and, and regional partners. Oh uh, yeah, thank you. And um... I think it also connects well with what Rosalind just said in terms of, you know, if, if, if the Sudanese uh, in the center and if the international community um, is forgetting again that Sudan exists for, uh, more of the center, that there is the periphery that is basically driving um, the politics in the center, um, I think then, of course, we will have a huge, huge problem. And again, I think it's, it's the contextual understanding you know, we've been through this in South Sudan. We've, we've, 
basically seen that in, in Sudan. Why is Hameti so emboldened? Why does he feel that he is also, you know, carrying the voice of the marginalized on his shoulders? And why can he go through with this? Um, I think is exactly this neglect and it's re replicated by the international. So yes, of course, I agree, Rosalind, if, if this is only going to be, uh, you know, concentrating on um, COVID response, and short term and center and basically Sudan equals Khartoum, um, it's going to be a failure, absolutely. Um, but the question and the, the, the further question is, um, and that goes to the Sudanese, how can more voices and stronger voices, not only from the peripheries, but in the peripheries, not only those who managed to come to Khartoum and be part of the transitional government, but those who are not in Khartoum. How can that be part of the political and the economy and the, you know, not just the polit political economy, but everything that is necessary um, to carry whatever decisions are made right now and to implement. And I think this is going back to the implementation part. Absolutely agreed. It's not just the br brain drain. It really is the capacity and the absorption capacity and can, you know, it starts with um, who, who is bringing the analysis and who is planning. Is it, you know, is that something that should come from the outside? I would warn, of course, you know, looking at South Sudan, if you don't have ownership, um, it's not going to go anywhere. So these issues are necessary and they're extremely political right now, exactly because they're, you know, the World Bank and the IMF are getting um, more, well, when they start having more to do with Sudan. So I think these are very critical junctures right now where one has to bring the political uh, assessment and the planning capacities in Sudan to afford to lead that process um, and not to be overrun by that process. Uh, Jonas, I, of course, I think, you know, that's the, the critical point. Um, can we convince the will there be a matching of value systems and ideologies between uh, the Europeans and, and the Gulf states or the Europeans and the Americans and the Gulf states? No, of course not. I think this is going to be an ongoing um, friction. It's not just the friction in Sudan, you know, look at the Red Sea, uh, look at the port economy by the, by the UAE, look at the UAE position in, in Libya. Um, and the Europeans haven't done their job so far to really a, have a unity of understanding what it is they want, um, and B, have an understanding what it is to communicate to, to the Gulf states, because it's so, you know, everybody knows that, but of course the Gulf states for the Europeans are always seen in the context of, um, of the Iranian, um, of the Gulf Iranian relationships and the split of the GCC. So, um, I know I'm not answering the question, but I think one has to really, well, stress the point for the Europeans to be more ambitious and to be more emboldened, to take a political position and not just trying to convince uh, the Gulf states, but trying to convince with more force the Gulf states that it's in everybody's benefit, benefit I mean, it's for everybody's benefit um, to strengthen. I think one, one important point for the Gulf states to maybe understand on a pragmatic economic level is if the international financial institutions are starting to engage on Sudan, this is where, you know, this is to their benefit as well. Um, the IFIS will not start to engage if there is a coup, if there is, you know, one man show, um, at least it, it's not going to be so fast. Um, I'm not saying they're not engaging because we see that in, in, in neighboring countries. So um, that would be my response on, on these three questions. Thank you. Thank you, you Annette. Um, just in the interest of time, I know we're running over, so maybe we could uh, focus, I guess, on, on, on our interventions, one, one question each. Um, there was one very specifically there for you, Lauren, as well, about uh, you know, the cooperation of the transitional government with, with the ICC. Um, thank grateful for your reply on that. Sure. Um, so, so let me start and just go back a bit. Um, most of the U.S. economic sanctions on Sudan were lifted back in 2017. Uh, what you're, what you may sort of be thinking of right now is, is um, to some extent a hangover. 
um, you know, a lot of the international banks uh, basically de-risked. They pulled out of Sudan uh, after those, uh, that fine against BNP Paribas. Uh, and many of them haven't gone back in, uh, not because there is actually a law uh, prohibiting them from doing so, but because of the, the reputational risk um, that still uh, sits over Sudan in part because of the SST designation, um, but also, you know, it, it's just going to take some time to get back in. A lot of the, the Sudanese banks um, have to sort of develop uh, more robust due diligence procedures. There's a lot of sort of banking specifics to this. Um, I think you'll see that happen. It's not going to be immediate, um, but most of the economic sanctions, again, have been lifted. Um, the ICC issue is incredibly complicated here in Washington. Uh, I think some of you may have seen uh, the Trump administration taking some steps this week um, to create a new sanctions regime uh, in response to an investigation that the ICC is doing into alleged war crimes um, by, by US forces in Afghanistan. Uh, and that really has soured the relationship um, between the United States and the ICC, which was never sort of um, terribly robust to begin with. Um, you know, I think that there are a lot of people here in Washington, D.C. who very much welcomed uh, the arrest and transfer to The Hague of, of Ali Kashab uh, last week. Um, I think and saw it as very positive, um, also saw very positive the, the response by the government of Sudan, uh, the transitional government in welcoming uh, that arrest and transfer and signaling uh, that they would work with the ICC. You know, regardless of your feelings of the ICC, I think a process of, of justice and accountability uh, for those implicated in, in uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity in Darfur is very important to see. So um, some mixed views here in Washington, I don't think that that um, ICC uh, case will impact the SST decision. I think um, that is that has sort of largely been resolved and is is um, largely now tied to the settlement of claims uh, by by the victims of the 1998 embassy bombing and, and resolving some of that. Um, I wanted to also address briefly um, Rosalind's question, which is a great one. Um, you know, and and. Um, sitting on Capitol Hill and, and dealing with members of Congress, there has always been a great deal of interest in uh, the voices from Darfur and Southern Kordofan and Blue Nile. Uh, and, um, you know, in the context of uh, the Security Council's deliberations on the future of the peacekeeping mission in Darfur and the creation of a new peace, uh, peace operations mission, um, political support mission, by the United Nations, uh, the Congress uh, actually was was very concerned about the departure, uh, premature departure of peacekeepers from Darfur, uh, and engaged quite substantively with the administration, the Trump administration, um, to make sure that the U.S. pushed for continued protection of civilians by by UN forces in Darfur. Um, really, sort of feeling that uh, the time was not ripe for peacekeepers to leave. Uh, and, and frankly, I think this is an area where uh, both um, a number of members engaged on Capitol Hill uh, and, and the administration are quite concerned with the, the position that the government has taken uh, in terms of wanting to see peacekeepers leave by the end of the year. Um, I think uh, there are a number of signs, uh, both from Darfur and from Southern Kordofan, that, um, that uh, security forces are not ready uh, necessarily to take on full uh, responsibility for protecting civilians. I think there is still a great level of mistrust uh, in Darfur. And you know, I, I think it was noticeable that we saw a lot of, um, a lot of voices from Darfur, um, community leaders from the IDP camps, uh, a number of letters from civil society groups, the Darfur Bar Association, others um, expressing concern about this pressure for peacekeepers to leave. Um, some of the armed groups involved in the peace talks representing Darfur um, also similarly weighing in and saying this is not the time for UNAMID to leave. Um, and, uh, and the transitional government has taken a different position. Um, you know, I think that is a that is a rub in the relationship, and and it does strike me that um, uh, you know I, I would like to hear more about the the um, transitional government's deliberations and 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 their response to those 
concerns raised by the Darfuris about um, about the future of uh, peacekeeping in, in, in Darfur. But. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you very much. And then, and and turning finally to Suleiman, just for um, I guess a wrap up of any points you might have, Suleiman. Um, you know, in the interest of time, we're running quite a bit over, but it'd be great to get your th final thoughts. Uh, yes, uh, on the question of the ICC, um, of course, there is now you know uh, recognition uh, of, by Sudan of the jurisdiction of the ICC on war crimes committed in Darfur. The, the issue is whether Sudan would agree to uh, transfer uh, the indictees Bashir, uh, Abdul Rahim, Ahmed Hussein, and Ahmed Harun that are in the custody of Sudanese transitional authorities to the court in, in The Hague. There are no formal discussions between the ICC, but uh, you know, a cordial uh, dialogue that has started between the prosecutor and the prime minister. And I believe this is paving the way for some formal engagement in which the future of these indictees would be determined. Uh, either uh, trials uh, within Sudan that will be recognized by uh, ICC uh, up to the international due process standards that are required under the Rome Statute, or you know some other form that would be satisfactory to both sides. Uh, on the issue of um, center periphery, uh, of course it's important to keep in mind also that the periphery is not uh, you know a silent uh, majority and that the space created since the fall of Bashir is involving many groups on the ground to make their voices heard and to organize and to attack the surviving uh, you know, interest of the kleptocratic system in their respective regions. The interesting thing is that these civic movements are now coordinating at the national level uh, they are, uh, you know, very organized and effective in what they are trying to do by drawing attention to causes that are of harm to their own communities. And it's saddening me to say that the freedom and change forces and the government of the transition is not yet very attentive to what's happening beyond Khartoum. They are just consumed by the political intrigue and repositioning that is occurring in the capital. Uh, I'm not paying attention to all these voices uh, so far. Uh, I do hope that whatever international assistance is coming is not going to aggravate this problem by you know, focusing more in you know, the, the structures in the center and, and you know, not sufficiently uh, on the periphery. Uh, again, uh, I would say that uh, the concern for the role of the Gulf countries is seen by the Sudanese public opinion as one major threat to the transition to democracy and civilian rule. They would simply want, the Sudanese would simply want uh, Gulf countries, whether it's the regional axis of Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates and Egypt, or the competing one of, you know, you know of the uh, Qatar, uh, Turkey, and so on, to leave the Sudanese alone, uh, allow them to settle their problems in this very complex and somewhat confusing and you know, uh, very chaotic manner, but you know, they appear to be able to manage things and get a few things done. Uh, and, and they wouldn't want to see any of these competing regional uh, you know, access trying to interfere and, and move uh, you know, the, the future of Sudan in a way that, that serve their uh, strategic interests and not what the Sudanese see uh, as their own national strategic interests. And believe me, this sense of ownership of the future of Sudan by the people and not by the structures that are in power today is very real and it's going to be uh, you know, uh, the, the source and the energy for a major pushback uh, if any of the two competing regional axes try to hijack uh, the future of the country. And I would leave it at that. Thank you, uh, Mohammed. Thank you very much, Suleiman. And, and my thanks to all our three speakers today for providing their time and also um, expertise to us and delving into so many of these complex uh, and a lot of them unanswered issues. Uh, my thanks also finally to, to all of our participants for joining us today. Uh, please do keep well and uh, we look forward to being in touch and seeing you again soon. Many thanks.